Okay, so the title of today's discussion is When Salvation Comes Home. I'm going to ask you a few questions. This is not going to be a sermon. Okay, this is going to be a discussion. We're going to teach as Jesus taught in the scriptures, the very best way of learning the Bible. And so the first question I want to ask you is, who are the three main characters in this story? Just shout some stuff out. Who are the three main characters? Jesus, Jesus number one. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. And um, the, crowd. the crowd. Well done, Dan. Yeah. So we have Jesus in Hebrew. His name is Yeshua, which means salvation. Remember that for later on. Jesus' name means salvation. We have Zacchaeus in Hebrew. It's Zacchae, which means innocent. And then we have the crowd as well, who are part of this story. Now, when we say that this is a story, we don't mean this is a made-up story. What we mean is these are real life events that took place in the life and ministry of Jesus, but they've been written in story form for the purpose of teaching us something. Everything in the Bible has been written to teach us something of value. And this story uh, included has something of real value and depth, spiritual depth in it for us to, to master this morning. The second question I want to ask, these are kind of questions I ask myself when I prepare talks. The second question is, where is the tension in the story? Where is their tension in the story? Crowd. Crowd, why? Yeah, and why do they think Zacchaeus was a sinner? Tax collectors were considered to be the scum of the earth. Tax collectors were the scum of the earth. Now, was he a tax collector or was he something even more than that? He was a chief chief tax collector, right? Which means that he was the top guy amongst all tax collectors so tax collectors were bad enough because what they would do they would uh, take money from their own people the jewish people and they would take a little cut of that money they'd charge more than what they should have charged from rome take that little cut for themselves but then the chief tax collector would want a cut from all of the cuts of the lower tax collectors amongst them so people like zacchaeus zacchaeus got incredibly wealthy off of the backs of their own Jewish people. And so they were absolutely hated by the Jewish people. They absolutely hated um, the tax collectors. Now, why would this have been dangerous for Zacchaeus? Because they most likely tried to kill him. Yeah, who would want to kill him? Everyone. <laughs> well, no, no, uh, they all hated him, but specifically there was a group of people, beginning with Zed, that hated oh, tax Zed. collectors. Zed. The zealots, and what zealots would do is go through the crowds of people with a little knife in their hand, go up behind the person they didn't like and put it in their kidneys and then disappear into the crowd again. So for Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector, to be amongst a huge crowd of his own people, he was taking his life in his own hands. Usually they were protected by a, by a soldier or they were in very visible places so they could be protected. But here amongst the crowd of people who hated him, Where there were zealots present, like Judas Iscariot, Zacchaeus was in a very perilous situation. Question number three, why did Zacchaeus want to see Jesus? Why do you think he wanted to see him? Had he ever got taxes off him? Had he got taxes from Jesus? Who knows? He He wanted to see who he was. Intrigue, curiosity. What might you have heard about Jesus? What's been happening prior to this? Miracles. Miracles, okay. Now, what did the Jewish rabbis teach about the coming of the Messiah? What did the Messiah do when he arrived? Overthrow the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's true. So maybe Zacchaeus is a little bit worried about his job. Oh, who knows? Yeah, what else? What type of miracles would the Messiah perform that normal people couldn't perform? Healing a Jewish leper. Healing people born blind. Driving out mute demons. Yeah, so these three miracles, according to the rabbis, normal people couldn't perform. You could perform other healing miracles, but those three healing miracles, healing of a Jewish leper, healing of a a man born blind, and healing somebody with a mute demon, uh, that was something only the Messiah could do. And Jesus had been performing these miracles all throughout Israel, and that's why he was drawing such big crowds. Because the crowds are saying, hey, this Jesus character, he's doing the very things that our rabbis have taught us only the Messiah is supposed to be able to do. So maybe this Jesus is who? 
the Messiah and Zacchaeus wanted to see this Jesus and wanted to decide for himself, could this possibly be the Messiah? Now, why might Zacchaeus' attempt to see Jesus appear to be undignified? Climbed a tree. And what did Jewish men wear in those days? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tunics, right? They didn't wear trousers like we do today. Okay, and who is he representing? Oh. Rome. Rome. He is a Jewish tax collector for Rome, a chief tax collector, somebody of great importance to Rome because Rome was being funded by this guy through the Jewish people, of great importance. And he's wearing a, a, a very long dress type of thing. So climbing a tree is probably not the most dignified thing you can be doing in that position of honor and wearing that item of clothing. So businessmen who work for Rome, generally speaking, did not go around climbing trees, okay? Especially when they were in a tunic. So what was it that caused Jesus then to stop and call Zacchaeus down from the tree? The sycamore tree. What was it that caused Jesus to stop and say, Zacchaeus, come down from there? Why did Jesus pick him out? Weren't all the crowd sinners? Because he, loved he was a chief sinner. He was a chief sinner. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, boy. Always claimed he was a sinner. So even yeah. the crowd called him a sinner, even though the sinners themselves. Absolutely. So the crowd saw him as what? Like the. The king of sin, the chief sinner that, you know, if Jesus could relate to him and show him love and mercy and grace and kindness, then he could show it to anyone. Right. And that's good news for us in here, because no matter what you've done in your life, whatever you're ashamed of in your past, the great thing is, is that there is enough mercy and there is enough grace in Jesus to forgive you if you repent. Now, he's not going to forgive you if you don't repent. So let's not think that for a second that jesus just forgives me no 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 no. there's always got to be repentance before forgiveness but if you're humble enough to repent and to acknowledge that what you've done is wrong and you come to god on the basis of humility and repentance then god can and he will forgive you because he doesn't love to hold sin against any of us does he he loves to forgive us and he loves to bring us into that relationship so that's one amazing reason can anybody think of another reason why Jesus specifically chose him? The fact that he was willing to die just to see Jesus. Wow. Okay. He was willing to risk everything he had, including de- his life, death, yeah, to see Jesus. Fantastic answer. A little round of applause for that one. Not too much. We don't want to get him proud. Um, well done, Donna. Can anybody think of another reason? Yeah. Before, beforehand, he spoke a parable of the rich man, the rich young ruler, and he said um, that. And the disciples asked him, "If he can't get into the kingdom of God, then who can?" And God, Jesus said, "With man, nothing's impossible. All things, things are impossible. With God, all things are possible." And then the next chapter is this rich man. Awesome, fantastic. So from that, Jesus knew his heart. He knew that even though this man was a a gross sinner in his day, that there was something in his heart that was stirring. The spirit of God was stirring in this man to want to see Jesus, want to meet Jesus, want to have forgiveness from Jesus because he was such a great sinner. He had that weight of guilt upon him that he just wanted forgiveness. And he hoped that Jesus was the Messiah uh, to the point where he was willing to risk his life, willing to climb the tree. He was one of the chief sinners of the day and he just wanted Jesus to save him. So... If we can look at Zacchaeus in the tree as a piece of fruit, what type of fruit is he? A monkey nut. (laughs) Monkey nut. You're insane. Um, What type of fruit is he? Unripe or ripe? He is a ripe fruit in the tree ready for plucking. And Jesus knows where everybody is. Some of us in here today, maybe we're a little bit hard. We're not in that right place yet for that repentance and that forgiveness to take place but there are other people in here who came here ripe for the plucking maybe you don't know the lord 
maybe you've been going to church your whole life, but you don't know Jesus as your saviour. But today there is something moving in your heart and you just feel like today is the day that I've got to repent, change my life and get right with God. And that's because you are ripe for the plucking right now. And Jesus knows where everybody is at because Jesus is omniscient. He's all knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at once by his spirit and he's omnipotent. He's all powerful, which means that no matter what state you've got yourself into, he can bring you out of it. Yeah, whatever mire or sewage you got yourself into, he can just lift you straight out of it, cleanse you straight down with his blood, fill you with his Holy Spirit and transform you from the inside out like that. That's the power of Jesus today. If we're just willing to repent. So Jesus supernaturally knew that he was ripe for the plucking. Question number eight. Number six. For those of you who are uh, sorry about that. When Jesus called to Zacchaeus, why did Zacchaeus respond the way he did? Now look at the way that he, if you've got your scriptures in front of you, look at the way in which he responded. What did he say? Somebody just shout it out, Rich. Going to give up his wealth. Specifically, what does he say specifically? He says, I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. Half of my possessions to the poor. Cheated anybody out of anything, which obviously you had. Yep. Um, I will pay back four times that amount. I will pay back four times the amount of anything that I've cheated out of anybody. Why did Zacchaeus respond like that? Shame, absolutely. Complete change of life. Conviction of the spirit, change of life. Money was no longer his god. Money was no longer his god. Awesome. More specifically, we're going to we'll get into the, the nitty gritty of the detail now. Why did he respond like this, being was a Jew? This, was this the maximum amount that the old knows the land? Wow, okay. Yes. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> That's too much. That's too much. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a Jew. And being a Jew, he would have been raised in synagogue. He knew that what he was doing was wrong before the Lord. One of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not steal. steal, okay? And Zacchaeus had been stealing. And when we face the law of God, we come under conviction because the law highlights to us where we have screwed up, where we have gone wrong. When the Bible says, thou shalt not lie, all of a sudden we feel guilty in our conscience because we've all told lies, right? We're all liars, every one of us. And so the law reveals to us our standing before God. We stand before God as liars. If we've ever stolen something, we stand before him as thieves. And who's never stolen something in their life? Now, maybe you're here today and said, well, I've only ever stolen a stick of gum from my brother or sister. Well, if you've stolen a stick of gum or a hard-boiled sweet, the value of the thing that we steal is irrelevant, right? What makes us a thief is the fact that we've taken something that doesn't belong to us. Whether it's a penny chew... I don't think those things exist anymore. A 10 pence chew. <laughs> or whether it's £10,000 from a bank. If we take something that doesn't belong to us, we are all condemned before the law of God as thieves. Now put your hand up in here today if you've never stolen anything. You're a liar. <laughs> so when, when we stand before God, we stand before him as liars. We stand before him as thieves. If we've looked with lust towards somebody, um, then we stand before him as, uh, idol uh, as adulterers or fornicators. If we worship money and we put our money before God, we're idolaters. I mean, when you look at yourself and you compare yourself into the mirror of the Ten Commandments, boy, oh boy, do we fall short. Yeah. We are revealed as sinners before God. And Zacchaeus, being a Jew who knew the law, he, the weight of guilt upon him, the weight of conviction upon him for all of the gross sins he had ever committed, it was just crushing him. But he also knew in the law of Moses that it says this. Exodus 22 verse 1 says, Whoever steals an ox, has ever stolen an ox before? Those things are not easy to steal, right? <laughs> This isn't like a packet of chewits from a local shop. An ox is big. Whoever has stolen an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it 
must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. If you steal a sheep, you got to pay back four times the amount of a sheep. Second Samuel chapter 12, verses four to six. Um, Nathan, the prophet, is speaking to David, King David. And King David has behaved really wickedly um, in wanting to take Uriah's wife. And uh, Nathan, the prophet, comes to David with this story. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He's full of fury, right? He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan turns around to David and says, you're the man. You took another man's wife. You're the one that deserves to die. You're the one that deserves to pay back fourfold, David. And David just comes under the weight of conviction of the law where Nathan the prophet confronts him with this. Now, Zacchaeus knows as a chief tax collector that he has been stealing and robbing from his own people. The weight of guilt and conviction from the law of Moses is upon him. And so when Jesus, the Messiah, actually begins to talk to him, begins to develop a relationship with him and says, Hey, Zacchaeus, I've got to come to your home today. Zacchaeus is like, what? You want to have fellowship with me? The Messiah of Israel is interested in me? He was shown such mercy, such love and such grace from Jesus that he turned around and said, well, Lord, if you're willing to show me such love, I'm going to show love in return. In my repentance, I'm going to put things right. If I've stolen from anyone, I'm going to pay them back fourfold. And half of my possessions, I'm going to give to the poor. And Jesus said, I'm going to stay at your house today, Zacchaeus. Jesus' name is what? Salvation. The Lord saves. He says, salvation has come to your home. Basically, Yeshua has come to your home. Jesus has come to your home. Because this man was a son of Abraham. He was a Jew. And he repented and trusted in the Messiah. And that's all you need to do, folks, to be saved. Repent and trust in the Messiah. Now, from this story, is the true fruit of repentance just saying sorry? Or is it something more than that? It's changing. Turning around 180 degrees. Yep, that's the fruit of repentance. What else in this story? Recompense. Recompense. Restitution. Putting things right that you've done wrong in your life. So that maybe there's somebody in your life right now who you know in the past you've treated badly. You've got to put that right. Send them a text message. Say sorry. If you're old school like me, you don't have a phone, write a letter, put a stamp on it, send it. Pick up the phone. Say sorry. If you've stolen from someone or something, pay them back. If you're scared of getting arrested by the police, put it in an envelope, unmarked, pay it back. Make recompense for anything you've done in your life. Otherwise, you're always going to carry that with you. Mm -hmm. You've done something to someone, you've said something about someone, you've treated people in a harsh way, you've stolen something that doesn't belong to you. If you can, it's not always within our capability to do it, but if you can, restore that. Mm -hmm. If you can. I appreciate if you've stolen somebody's car in the past, you can't necessarily afford 20 grand to buy them a new car. I appreciate that. But you can write a letter and say sorry. That's true repentance. It's not just saying sorry. It's putting things right again. True? Not just about saying sorry to your wife and then mistreating her again, is it? 
It's about saying sorry to your wife and actually treating her like a princess. princess. Behave yourself. It's not about saying sorry to your husband when you throw in the fry, frying pan at him. And the next day you lose your temper and, and throw the cutlery or the crockery. Stuart knows what I'm talking about. Why are we laughing at there, Stuart? Leslie's not in the room, Sue. Okay. But it's about saying sorry to your husband and respecting him and not throwing the frying pan again or throwing the cutlery or the crockery again, right? That's repentance. It's putting things right. And if we're willing to repent and trust in the Messiah, he will forgive us. He will save us. He will come to our home and live with us. And our home isn't necessarily the four walls and the roof where we live. It's us. It's our body. It's our temple. He wants to come and live inside of you and give you the strength and the power and the grace to live the type of life he wants us all to live holy lives righteous lives lives where we can shine not with self-righteousness not where we look down our noses at people because we we've all screwed up we've all messed up we have no right to look down our noses at anybody but lives where we can live before god and people can look at us and just say wow i sound like owen wilson then didn't i wow mind blown Shakespeare said that. Um, sorry, BFS commercial, I think it was. And uh, you did, you're distracting me now. Pack it in. I've lost my train of thought. If we, <laughs> if we repent, God will forgive us. God will come and live with us. He will give us the power to live a holy life. Don't try and live a holy life in the flesh. Impossible. You can't do it. But if you want to be holy, then you rely upon the power of Christ. And he will give you all the power you need to live the holy life he wants you to live. So in closing then, the final question. And one I'm hoping there are lots of answers to. What's the point of this story? What does it teach us? Why did God inspire it to be in his word? It teaches us that God thinks everyone is worthy of salvation. Amen. Yeah. Okay, gives us the, that template, that process of salvation. Absolutely. No one is beyond the reach. No one's done something so bad. They haven't shocked God. They haven't done something so bad that they can't be, they can't come to repentance. And I just think what struck me this morning was, I think there's probably a lot of people out there that just say, I'm not good enough for God because yeah. I, I killed somebody in a fifth grade or whatever yeah. it is. And actually, God's mercy, Jesus' blood is for everybody. No one's out of reach. No one is out of reach. They can put themselves. Yeah. Walls up, but God wants to break those walls down. Absolutely. As you said, somebody might say, oh, I killed somebody in a fit of rage. So, you know, God can't forgive me. Well, that's not true. The Apostle Paul was there helping in the stoning of Stephen, one of the Christians. And God saved him. And if God can save Paul, he can save anyone. And that's the good news. What else? God's an example. Pardon? God wants, to fellowship God wants fellowship with us, Rich. That's an example as well. He's showing us how to forgive, isn't he? He's showing us how to forgive, absolutely. Yeah. What else? Showing us that we too can reach out to the unlovely. Yes. We too can reach out to... The unlovely. Yeah, the unlovely, the, the sinners of our day. Yeah, absolutely. We can reach out to them with the same grace and compassion. Amen. Awesome. So just for the camera, salvation is when um, not in the crowd, not in the tree, not in even in the law of Moses, because that just brought condemnation and conviction to him. It was when he had that relationship with Jesus and Jesus entered into his home that repentance and faith brought about that salvation. Anything else? Teach that to step out in faith and trust. Excellent. I think it um, teaches like, the, the gravity and the weight that Jesus held as well. It holds. Mm. Where um, a guy who's so adamant and persistent in his old ways and his you know, stealing ways mm. didn't even question it until he wanted to seek 
Jesus. Mm. And it just shows you the weight that his name really does hold. Where yeah, the weight of Jesus. It you instantly and convicts you. And, and just that moment of sort of guilt and horror that you're like, oh my gosh, what have I done? Mm. You're just ready to give it all up for God. And yeah. It really shows that. Absolutely, yeah. It just who Jesus is, the weight of that character, that personality, that divine nature. Um, and Zacchaeus kind of got that, didn't he? He got it to such an extent that he was willing just to give up. Half, I mean, how many of you would be willing to give up every half of what you got in the bank right now? Let me see a show of hands, people. <laughs> Stuart, get the collection bag ready. No, I'm just joking. Um, but that's massive. That is massive. And giving back four times the amount to everybody he's stolen from? That's not like one or two people, folks. This is like a lot of people that he's stolen from over a long period of time. He's going to have nothing left. And that's the effect that Jesus had on him. Has Jesus had that effect on us? Also, what a good witness for Christ he was that he could give up four times of everything he'd owned yeah. for somebody that he'd only just met and heard of before. Mm. And actually he'd done that because of repentance and the change of heart because he wanted a relationship with Jesus. Yep. And what a good witness that was for everybody else. He's a massive sinner and look what he's just given up. Yeah. Changed his character completely. Changed, turned his life around for Jesus Christ. And he had gone from disobeying yeah. God's law, mm. God's voice, God's word, mm. to suddenly obeying it. Mm. Yeah. And saying, right, well, I'm going to put God first. I'm going to put the Messiah first. I just want to say as well that Zacchaeus <clears throat> was chosen that day. Out of everybody that was there, yeah. Jesus went there specifically yeah. knowing he was his past and went there that day to speak to him just for him just for him and that's how personal God knows each of us like you said he was there he was in the, the tree ready that fruit ready to pluck him mm. Jesus knew his heart before he even met him he, he mm. knew that there was a purpose in being there that day mm. and that's how Jesus meets and wants to meet every yeah. single one of us mm. yeah. amen that we're chosen for him. Oh. Uh, yeah, can you justify what the difference is between conviction and condemnation? Okay, so conviction makes you feel guilty about a crime you've committed. And when you feel guilty, you can do one of two things. You can either harden yourself against that guilt and try and deaden the conscience, like taking batteries out of a smoke alarm, trying to shut it down. Or you can respond to that feeling of guilt and repent and be saved condemnation is when somebody judges you without giving you the ability to repent so in the old testament if you committed adultery you would feel guilty if you got caught but then you'd be stoned to death you were condemned with no possibility of repentance because it was a sin that led to death whereas other sins like lying for instance um or stealing you could be found guilty but be given the chance to repent and to restore what you had done so within christianity we don't ever condemn anybody only god can condemn to the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment what we do is that we bring conviction upon people and people will often turn around to me and say and say don't try and condemn me because they're feeling guilt but that's not condemnation that's conviction and those two are vastly different conviction always gives you the opportunity to be saved condemnation means you're damned without any hope and so we don't ever condemn anyone in this church or in the church of christ but we certainly do bring conviction through the law of god so that people can be saved Okay, then, in one, one final story, then, to close. Hope you enjoyed this. Do you enjoy this? Is it more fun than a sermon? Different to a sermon? More interactive than a sermon, right? Okay, we're going to mix things up. Who's ever heard of Dwayne The Rock Johnson? Yes. yes. The Rock. And uh, he was uh, raised in Hawaii. And before he was a professional wrestler, D uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson used to go to the gym every day. 
and he used to have to like walk i think like seven miles to the gym every day because he didn't have a car he wasn't very rich his family were very poor and so he would travel to the gym every day and on the way to the gym there was like a 7-eleven which is like a convenience store like one of our spas and every day he would go into this 7-eleven and when the guy behind the counter wasn't looking he would steal a king-size snickers bar and put it in his pocket because he didn't have money for food. He literally couldn't afford a Snickers bar. That's how poor he was. And so then on the way to the gym, he would eat this Snickers bar to give him some energy so that he could work out and build those big muscles that he's now famous for. And so he did this for, he said, weeks upon weeks, year after year, going to the gym every day, stealing a Snickers bar every day. Well, when he grew up and he got famous and he moved to America and became a, a, an international kind of celebrity through his wrestling and through his movies... He decided to go back to Hawaii with his daughter. And uh, when he went back there, he just felt guilty. I, mean, I don't think he's a Christian, but he still came under the conviction of the law of God. Because the law of God is written on our hearts, right? The, when Gentiles do the very things required by the law, it shows that the law is written on their hearts. And he felt guilty for stealing the Snickers bar every day. So he wanted to go back there and pay the guy back for all of the Snickers bars he had stolen over the years. So he decided to go back there with his daughter under this conviction. And when he went back there, he walked in and the guy was there behind the counter doing drugs. <laughs> so he was with his daughter and now it turned, kind of turned into this drug then. And he thought to himself, well, what am I going to do here? I can't kind of give this guy money because he's just going to use it on drugs. So he kind of walked away, went on his way and said to his daughter, hey, listen, I wanted to teach you a good moral lesson, <laughs> but I've changed my mind. And he went the other way. But um, really... He wanted to give the guy $500 because he came under the conviction of the law of God. And really what that teaches us is that, you know, every single one of us, even Dwayne The Rock Johnson, has been created in the image of God. And we will never have true peace in our life until we start living in accordance with God's character. Because that's how we've been designed. And we can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a while, right? And we can steal something or lie about something to get a promotion in work or whatever. But in our conscience, if, if in our conscience we're carrying around this guilt, we're never going to be at peace. We're never going to be happy. We're never going to have the joy of God. So this morning, may we as a people not only be a people who say to God, God, I'm sorry. But God, I'm going to put right in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.